All right, we've got kids ministry again this morning. Just to let you know that after today, as it says in the bulletin there, then uh, we'll be ending it for the summer. Give our give our parent or give the uh, the kids a break. Give the uh, the leaders a break. Encourage them to come back next year. I'm going to sit today because uh, I've either hit menopause. Hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold for the last three days, or I'm battling a fever. I'm not exactly 100% sure. So to prevent myself from passing out and falling over, I'm going to sit. It feels weird to be down this low, but we're going to do it anyway. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 13. I also brought a towel today so I can feel like a Southern Baptist, you know, Hellfire and brimstone preacher. Uh, I want to read two verses today from Hebrews chapter 13. One is verse 7 and the, uh, the other one is uh, verse 17. So Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and then 17. Verse 7, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of, the, of God Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, approach this text and... uh, are no doubt dealing with uh, things that are very countercultural. They're things that cause problems when we hear the words obey, when we hear the words submit. Uh, They bring things up within us, um, experiences that may not have been good. Uh, They run counter to our sinfulness. And so we pray, Lord, that you would illuminate your scriptures Lord, help us to understand what it is that you are truly asking of us. And Lord, may you develop within us the disposition, the attitude that you are requiring from this short little passage. We pray that as you do so, you would build your church, that you would glorify your gospel and your name among us. Amen. One of the things uh, that is exceedingly important for all of us to understand, church leaders, whether they be elders or deacons, pastors, uh, whatever it is, as well as the greater congregation, we must be diligent in understanding and following biblical patterns for church life. And uh, I am often amazed as I look around at churches and the way they structure themselves and the way they, they sort of... Uh, structure their pastoral staff, their congregational relationships, and how much they're influenced by uh, business, by politics, by the way in which the world likes to structure uh, things that are a little bit authoritarian, as opposed to paying attention to biblical scripture. But one of the things we have to remember about the relationship between pastors, elders, and people is that that relationship is a fundamental relationship. It is a tone-setting relationship for the spiritual growth of the body, uh, the development of each individual person within the body, and our witness as a body to those outside of the church. And these verses, uh, verse 7, verse 17, and we'll we'll refer to a bunch of other ones here as well, so we'll do a bit of a sword drill idea where we'll look at some other passages. Uh, what they do for us is they help us to understand how congregations are supposed to relate to elders and how elders are supposed to relate to congregations. And this verse in verse 17 is actually very simply directed. It tells you as a congregation how to treat me as an elder, how to treat Bob and Jim and Dylan as your elders. Uh, It's a difficult passage for me to preach uh, because of the position that I have. And it's 
awkward because as an elder, I'm required to preach the word to you, not vice versa. And yet at the same time, it can very easily come off as sort of a power thing. You know, typical elder telling me as the congregant how I need to listen to him and obey him. And so I need for you to understand that the goal is not to do that or to present that attitude to you. The, 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 the goal of what I want to talk about today is not simply one-sided. What we find here is a message, yes, primarily for the congregation, but embedded within it is also a message for the elders, for the leaders of the church. Because within this verse, we see how intertwined the leaders and the congregants are and how important that relationship is to the health of the church. Because as each group understands its responsibilities to God and to the other group and seeks to fulfill those responsibilities, the church is healthier, more reflective of God and becomes, as our author says, a betterment to all. So my purpose in preaching this sermon is very simple. It's the next verse. Uh, That's the beauty of preaching expositionally. You touch on things that you would normally avoid. Or you just get to things because they're right there. And so that's why we are here. And so my purpose is to simply do with this verse what I hope that I do with every other verse. Which is simply to preach the word of God as it is written here. My fundamental goal, essentially then, is to get you to understand your responsibilities to God, and then by implication to whoever else might be involved. So fulfilling the commands of both the leaders and the followers is done under the umbrella of the command to submit to Christ, who is the head of the church and the only Lord of our body. Because these are divinely instituted verses, these are inspired scriptures, we must recognize that the church cannot glorify God, cannot extol the gospel, cannot be healthy if we disobey this verse. A church whose leaders understand their responsibilities and fulfill them, and a congregation who understands their responsibilities and fulfills them, will be a healthy, vibrant, biblical, God-glorifying, gospel-proclaiming church. And so this, this last point is really the point of the passage, really the point of what I'm trying to say overall. Your submission to God in the Christian life is important for your well-being, and it is important for the well-being of those around you. And that's the way it is for every one of the commands in Scripture. Take whatever command you want in Scripture. Take whatever attitude you're supposed to have in Scripture, and and that is true. If you submit to God in the Christian life, you will be better, and those around you will be better. This is not simply by itself in that regard. And what we need to understand as as we approach this verse is that God in his wisdom in his kindness, has provided men to be your shepherds and your watchmen in your Christian life. It's a direct way of emulating Jesus by submitting to those shepherds. Because the life that Jesus lived was a life of constant obedience and submission. He was obedient to God's will. He was obedient to God's word. He was obedient and submissive to his heavenly father's purposes. And so all we are called to do in these verses, just as any other verse that we've come across in Hebrews, is to obey and submit to those things as well. Obey the will of your father, which is what we find in these verses. Now I want to say two things kind of as sort of caveats before we get into this verse. As I mentioned, I, I, I do not want you to think that I'm preaching this text to be self-serving or self-protecting. There's one thing that drives me absolutely insane about other churches, and that's when they need money, the pastor preaches on giving. 
When there's an issue of church discipline, the pastor preaches on church discipline. When the pastor is annoyed by something, he'll preach on that. And basically what he'll do is he'll turn this pulpit into a soapbox, into a place where he can hobby horse his, his latest topic. My goal here, as I said, is to just preach the next verse, regardless of how difficult it is, regardless of how controversial the topic is. And my goal, as in every text, is to be biblically faithful. Because one of the things that God does say in 1 Peter chapter 4 to the pastors and teachers, especially to those entrusted with the Word of God, is to speak as though you were speaking the very words of God. That's the standard for us preachers. Speak as though you were speaking the very words of God, as though God were standing behind you, nodding at every word you say. So my goal here is to go only where God wants us to go. So that being said, if you sense even a hint of self-servingness, or if there's anything within what I'm saying this week, or, or frankly every week, that goes against the text, or you feel is contradictory to some other part of Scripture that I may have missed, then I would ask that you please come and speak with me so I can correct my own thinking and then also make sure to correct that in the thinking of our church as a whole. The second thing is, is I want all of you to feel safe and free at CRC. I want you to have room to grow, to develop according to your unique gifts while at the same time being led and nurtured by those whom God has raised up in el as elders. I want you to be protected and guarded in a world that's filled with false doctrine and false teaching without being forced at any point to believe anything against your heart and conscience on the things that don't matter. I want you to feel the love and concern that the elders have for you. I want you to understand that we are both joyful and serious about what God has called us to do in your life. And we want you to be confident that we are leading you well without feeling controlled or coerced or in any way exploited or used for our personal gain. That's what I want this church to be about. It's a tall order, and it's only possible as we understand verses like Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. As we understand the elders' role regarding the congregation and the congregation's role regarding the church. So uh, what I'm going to do is, is you see here in your, uh, in your bulletins a little bit more of a detailed outline, I guess. What I want to do first is talk about the, the first couple of words there of verse 17. And then sort of take a little bit of a meandering sort of excursus here on elders and the nature of of an elder and our leadership, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. And then I want to come back to the second half of verse 17, which is uh, the benefit, the reason why obeying and submitting to your leaders is so very important, beyond the obvious fact that when God commands it, we ask for the grace to fulfill those commands. So let's just deal with these first, uh, these first two words, obey and submit, but to whom? Let's start with there. Uh, the author says leaders in this passage. And I think what our author is referring to is what other verses in Scripture talk about as elders. Uh, within Scripture, there are two groups of people that are supposed to be uh, sort of leading the church. The elders are the spiritual leaders in charge of shepherding the congregation. And then there are deacons who are in charge of uh, they're the sort of the service arm of the church. So specifically, elders are men chosen from among the local church who fit the criteria laid out in Scripture. You heard some of that being read by Jim this morning from 1 Timothy. There's also list in Titus as well. And not only do they have the characteristics of an elder, 
but they are those who are capable of fulfilling the role of an elder, which the scriptures outline uh, in various places. Uh, and we could sort of generally call that spiritual leadership over the body. Uh, probably the best summary text in this regard is 1 Peter chapter 5, where, where Peter says, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in charge, but being examples to the flock. So there we have sort of what the elders are supposed to do. They're supposed to shepherd the flock, lead it from the front, make sure that they find safe passage, good grazing land. And if one goes missing, to go after them. If one gets a little bit out of, out of line, to bring them back into line. Exercising oversight over the congregation. Uh, making sure that they do so eagerly, willingly, because they want to do so, and by being examples to the flock, not just by standing at the top looking down, but being, being an example to the flock. You follow me where I have already been. One of the things we do learn about uh, eldership within Scripture is that it is a plurality. Whenever you hear about elders in Scripture, it's always in the plural I exhort the elders among you. Uh, the elders are a group of individuals, not just one, from the congregation who are recognized as having the characteristics, having the leadership skills, the shepherding skills, and then are affirmed by that congregation to become elders over them. So when elders get together, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic because all elders uh, have sort of equal authority or representation on, and I hate this word, the board. I don't like the term elder board. I just like to talk about elders because board smacks of useless wasting of time. So the pastor is the church's leader, yet he is merely the first among equals among the elders. This means that all the elders as individuals, including me as the pastor, must obey and submit to the plurality of all the rest of the elders. So don't think for a second that obey your leaders and submit to them is only given to you as the congregation and not to me as one of the elders. Because as a singular elder, I am nothing. It is only when I am part of a plurality of elders acting that I have any kind of quote-unquote authority or reason to demand or ask for obedience and submission. So this means that obey and submit applies to the leaders, not to a leader and that is exceptionally important. Obey and submit applies to the plurality, the group, and never to a singular elder acting alone. So if an elder comes to you and says, you know what, I'm an elder, you need to do blank, you can ignore them. Unless they say to you, on behalf of the elders, I have been asked to come and speak with you. And if that happens, it'll usually be two of us to demonstrate the nature of plurality. That's how things work. So as we kind of continue to move through the, this, this message, we're going to see what these roles are and discover a bit regarding kind of how and why we're to fulfill those roles. So when, again, when we're talking about leaders, we're talking about a plurality of individuals who, who have certain characteristics, who have certain uh, spiritual characteristics which allow them to rule over the church as elders, as shepherds over the body. So with that understood, what does it mean for to obey and to submit? Our author in Hebrews here is being very, very simple, very quick. Obey your leaders and su to submit to them. Well, obey is, a, if I can say it this way, it's, it's a soft word. It's, it's a broad word. 
Uh, it speaks of, uh, of being persuaded by another person and then following that person. So being persuaded by them and then you're willing to follow them. It comes to mean obey in the context of trusting somebody. So they have this, I don't know if this is the right way of saying it, but they, they have more, they, they know more than you or they have a position higher than you. You trust them and so you follow them. That's sort of obey. It's the idea that the people are to listen to what their leaders say, embrace it, and follow them. Okay, submit, that's a, that's a hard word. There's no softening this one without uh, sort of causing problems with, with the text. It's a more narrow word. It, it literally would mean something like give way to uh, or, or defer to, yield to, that, that kind of thing. It involves willingly placing ourselves under another. So o- obey is, is sort of this broad thing that, that can happen in any kind of relationship. But submit, dare I say it, smacks of hierarchy. It suggests that there is somebody sort of in authority and somebody who is not. And the submission involves the one who is not an authority recognizing the authority of another and be willing to put themselves under that. And to this, I want to add uh, another word, which again uh, comes from uh, the First Timothy text, honor. In that text at the end of chapter 5, uh, Paul says that elders are, worth, are, are worthy of honor, respected. Uh, honored. Uh, I'm not sure I try to figure better words than honored, but I think we all know what that means. Uh, the general meaning is to give the elder respect, reverence. Not, not, not in the way that the Catholics talk about their priests or the Greek Orthodox talk about their holy fathers, but just understanding that they, they are in a particular place of spiritual leadership over you and the respect that is attached to that position you are giving to them. The double honor spoken of in, those pas- in that passage involves uh, paying those elders who serve as the teaching elder or the teaching pastor, as we call them, in a full-time capacity. So one of the ways in which you reverence or respect or honor the primary teacher in your in your body is by, by paying them so that they can do this full time to your benefit. So when we have words like obey and submit and, and honor, uh, those words can cause some problems within us. I think we can, we can immediately think of some difficulties that are brought up by hearing those words. We don't like those words. And I think there's, there's four kind of reasons, I think, why we don't like those words. The first one is the, the ever-present sin problem in our lives. The idea of an adult obeying another adult is a little bit strange to us. Outside of, of maybe the military or, or related fields, you know, RCMP, stuff like that, obedience language is, is not common in our, in our culture. As adults relate to other adults, we don't talk about obedience and submission and, and honoring, those kinds of things. Because as human beings, we, we don't like to obey. We don't like to submit to anybody. We have a, a love affair with individualism. And this often, often causes us to to rise up against the first smacks of authority in our lives. The first smack of of infringement upon my rights, which we claim to have far broader than what we actually have. Right? When when these authorities go against my opinions or my desires or or what I want or what I claim to, to have as my right, then we sort of recoil at this idea of obedience and submission. In other words, in all of us is a natural sinful response to submitting and obeying and honoring others because it's simply 
an act of my sinful self-preservation. Why should I submit to you? Now, I'm going to, as you know, I like to take all the shots I can at the Anabaptists, so I'm going to call this next one the Anabaptist problem or the Mennonite problem. It, the idea of congregational church, that to prevent power structures from, from occurring within the church, what we do is we give one vote to every member and then they decide on the, the movement of the church at endless, annoying, useless church membership meetings. So the church then as a group tends to lead around the leaders of the church. I remember when I was a very young man, I was doing my internship and I went to my first elder board meeting. Church council meeting, not elder board meeting. And uh, I went with my pastor who was sort of leading me and, and around the table there were 12 chairs. Six, I don't know, for somebody and six for somebody else. And off in the corner were two chairs for the pastor and for me. Very, very clear that we as the congregation lead the church and you as the pastors, you just do what we want, right? And you all know how that works, right? Power structures are either stated and affirmed by everybody or they're unwritten and they battle amongst each other, which is typical of Mennonite churches. So we have this idea that maybe the best way to rule the church is all of us rule it. Then we have the cultural problem. This is an understatement. We've become very postmodern in our culture. We are told that institutions are inherently evil and oppressive, especially if men are the ones in charge, the patriarchy. We are told that it is abhorrent to be told what to believe and what to do by someone else and to be asked to submit to someone else. And then within the context of institutionalized religion, the church, we find that kind of language to be a breeding ground for hierarchicalism, authoritarianism, the patriarchy and exploitation, which inevitably leads to violent oppression. And then I think we also have, for lack of a better way of saying it, the terrible leader problem. I strongly suspect that many here today have experienced to some degree wounds that have been inflicted by really bad leaders. In fact, I know that's the case because I've spoken to many of you who have had those experiences by leaders who have no business being in charge of a church. And as a result of that, they have been overbearing or excessively controlling, self-centered, self-serving. They've bullied within the local church. And so when you read about obedience and submission, you get a whole bunch of, of negative memories coming back into your mind because of the way you've been treated in the past by those who were in authority over you. So when we read these words in verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, we need to make sure that we are dealing with any barriers to how to accept and obey this text within us. We need to be honest about where we are as we read these words. Are we too me-focused? Am I too individually selfish? Am I too sinfully self-centered to hear what our author is saying? Am I, am I too steeped in the traditions of past churches uh, to be able to understand what the author is saying? Am I too influenced by our culture and its commitment to critical theory and social justice to be able to submit to scriptures over some bogus philosophy? Or am I too wounded to be able to hear what the Bible has to say? And so we need to be honest with ourselves. Have we believed something about the way the church should work that is based on my selfish perspectives or generational influences or our cultural situation or our personal experience with somebody somewhere else? So much so that I cannot or find it difficult to accept the biblical teaching concerning our response to church leaders. 
I recognize and we all understand. I, I read a book years and years ago. I tried to see if I still had it and I don't, but I think it was by Colson or Stott or something like that. Called when, or no, maybe it wasn't. When Churches Abuse. And I remember reading that as a very young man, as a, as a college student thinking, no, 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 churches aren't like this. <laughs> How foolish I was. That book didn't even cover the half of it. And so I recognize that this is a difficult topic for many of us. And I would implore you to search your own experiences, to search your own mentality, to search your own belief system to find out where there is this, this cultural or political or, or sinful barrier within you that prevents you from hearing the word of God. Because what the author wants to do is something exceedingly beneficial to you. The author wants to, you to hear that when you are a part of a church, you are part of God's structure. And because, of, because God has structured things in a certain way, you need to see the value of what God has done, the value of spiritual leadership, and recognize that spiritual leadership is, is not... It's not a man-made thing. It's, it's not something that the church made up in order to, to sort of um, influence, you know, male-dominated religion for whatever reason. It's an essential part of what God wants his body to look like. It's there for the benefit of the entire group. Think about Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up or for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. See, that's the way God has set up the church. And our, uh, the elders are simply a part of that. We are the shepherds and the teachers there to equip the saints, equip each one of you. And we are simply affirming this way of doing church because it's God's way of doing church. And so obedience and submission to leaders within the local church is is not optional. As you can see here within this text, it's, it's commanded. This isn't suggestion, it's, it's imperative. And so the church cannot exist with individualism as its foundation, either among the elders or among the congregations, because individualism is the breeding ground for division. Instead, the individual members of the church must look for ways to incite one another in the practices that are to characterize true believers, one of which is obedience and submission to leaders. As we've seen in numerous places in Scripture, it has always been God's plan, always, from the very beginning, to place his people, whether it's Israel, whether it's the church, under the care of leaders, of shepherds. And this means that it's God's design for these shepherds to lead while the member of the church follows this God-given leadership. So how does this obedience and submission look? Well, let me say this right off. That obedience and submission are heart issues before they are actions. See, outward obedience and submission without an inner changing of the heart is as sinful as outright and visible rebellion. That's true in all of Scripture. God cares about your heart, about your attitudes, about your disposition, about the way you think. And so it, John Piper talks about this in terms of de developing within each one of us a, a bent, a disposition, a strong leaning towards, a desire to obey and submit to your church leaders, sort of a, a default position within you which leads you to obey and submit to them. And I think that's a good way of, of thinking about it because it speaks 
to the heart issues that are, that are often at play when we do not want to obey and to submit to whatever authority faces us. See, when we don't want to obey and submit, that's a heart issue. And so to, to change to one of obedience and submission, a heart change needs to happen. So our submission to God-ordained authority is a true spiritual exercise. It's part of our development in our sanctification. And it's an element of our worship of God. And so we acknowledge that our submission to earthly authority is reflective of our submission to God's authority. And so when we put it in these terms, we understand immediately that when we seek a change in heart... We need Jesus. Now, we need Jesus at two levels. One is we need to be reminded of his attitude towards authority. As a boy, submitting to his heavenly father, submitting to his parents, in his overall ministry, reminding everybody, reminding his disciples, reminding uh, the Pharisees, I have come to do the will of my father. When he was asked, should I pay taxes? He says, you know what? You're a citizen. Pay taxes if you're required to pay taxes. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked his father, take this away from me. But if it's your will, I'll do it. His life was characterized by humble submission to the authorities that were over him. But his example is not ultimately what we need. Because it doesn't give us the things that are required to change our heart. What we need is the cleansing power of the gospel to make us more like him in, in his willing submission to his heavenly father. That's why I began by saying there's a bunch of reasons why this kind of stuff sort of grates against us. You need to reflect on it. You need to, to open yourself up to why it is that these things may be a problem for you. And you, you need in repentance and faith to allow Christ to work a change within you. So that obedience and submission to the leaders above you is something that is developed as a joyous response to your submission to God. So in an ideal world... With perfect men as elders, obey and submit wouldn't be a problem. But we don't live in this perfect, spiritual, utopian world. In fact, the Bible even speaks about and warns about the possibilities of elders going bad. Or of elders turning against God in their role as shepherds of God's flock. But it also offers solutions in how to deal with these disobedient men. So when it says obey and submit, what, what, it's a what is it talking about? Well, let's, let's recognize a few problematic things that, that uh, Scripture talks about because that will help us to understand what we should be obeying and submitting regarding. So Acts chapter 20, verse 30, this is an interesting text because Timothy was the pastor of the church to which Paul is warning so Paul is about to leave. He's talking to the elders as Ephesus. He's not going to see them again. And he warns this group of elders. So in other words, what Timothy has done is he has listened to Paul and he has created this group, of, this plurality of elders in the congregation in Ephesus. And then when Paul is leaving that congregation, he's headed off to Rome, he warns them and says, from among your own selves... Men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So there's clear implication here that, that, that it's possible that some elders will turn bad, that some are going to try and lead people away, and those leaders should not be obeyed. In other words, elders themselves can go rogue. And if they do, they need to be rejected. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul reminds the church very simply, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Accursed is very simple, damned to hell. In other words, the truth of God is the true test of leadership. The truth of God is the true test of leadership. 
1 Peter 5, that text we already talked about, we're told of three wrong motivations. For elders, that will be temptations that must be watched for. Watch out for elders who feel forced to be an elder, who don't want to do it willingly, but who are forced to do so. Be, uh, be careful of elders who, who pursue shameful gain, who, who use their position in the church to gain from it somewhere in business or politics or whatever. Be careful of elders who have a lordship mentality, who want to lord over you their authority. Because these are all evidence of an elder that is not doing his job in a godly manner. And in 1 Timothy 5, that passage, part of which, of which Jim read, he instructs Timothy in the church as to what to do if you find elders in this situation who have repetitive, unrepentant sin. He says, first, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. That's standard fare for anybody, by the way, right? That's sort of Old Testament standard, right? That's why Matthew 18, you go to that person, and if they don't repent, then you bring two or three witnesses, and if they don't repent, then you kind of go up the ladder. Same thing applies here to the elder. If they continue in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. In other words, rebuke them from the front in the presence of all the congregation so that the rest of them, the rest of the elders will be fearful of sinning. In other words, put all of these things together and you realize one very simple thing. Elders are not perfect. Elders are not perfect. And a procedure is put in place within Scripture to correct them, to disciple them, and if necessary, to discipline them if they refuse repentance. Passages are are clearly laid out. So what are we to do in light of these passages? Because it'd be very easy for us to say, listen, uh, you know, Scripture itself recognizes that elders can go rogue. It recognizes that there's a potential for, for, for elders to be shameful and to lord things over. So best that we not submit to leaders at all. Well, problem is Scripture doesn't say that. Scripture recognizes all of these things and then still says, obey and submit to your leaders. So, so how do we do that? Right? How do we prevent that, that pendulum from swinging both ways, or, or too far one way, where we just defer everything to our elders in an unbiblical fashion, or we take leadership and authority away from elders because we're so fearful of what might happen if they screw it up? Well, again, we pay attention to what Scripture says about these kinds of things. Right? We, we develop that disposition of submission that Piper speaks about as we pay attention to the, to the rest of Scripture. So let me start with this one. And this one, I, I think I'm pretty safe to say, I didn't ask uh, Bob, Dylan, or Jim about this one, but I think we would all agree that, that you absolutely should not do this. Do not be man followers. Be Christ followers. Do not be man fo I follow Paul. I follow this. I follow, I follow Jim. I follow Jared. I follow Dylan. We're a plurality of elders who are to lead you to Christ. So follow us as we follow Christ. Robert Machane, who was a, a Scottish Presbyterian minister in the, in the 1800s, quipped this. Do not make an idol of him. He's talking about the pastor. Do not make an idol of him. That will destroy his usefulness. I like that. Because you know what's going to happen, which you probably have if you've been here eight years. And if you still don't believe me when I say this, you can ask Tanya. I'm not perfect. Far from. So if you make an idol of me, you're very, gonna, you're very quickly going to find out that I am weak in some areas. And then your faith is going to crash because you don't recognize me as a sinner saved by grace, striving just like you. You will have set me on a pedestal where I have never asked to be. And when that pedestal crashes, you crash. Don't make an idol 
of your pastor. That will destroy his usefulness. Look up beyond him and above him. Do not stumble at his infirmities. There are spots on the sun and infirmities in even the best of men. Would you refuse gold because it was brought to you in a ragged purse? Would you refuse pure water because it came in a chipped bowl? The treasure of God is always in an earthen vessel. Following Christ is the church's priority. It's the elder's priority. It's your priority. We are to follow spiritual leadership only as they follow and imitate Christ and adhere to the teaching of the word of God. You are never required to obey and submit in areas that are clearly in conflict with the teaching of Scripture. That's why we encourage biblical discussion in this church. It is the norm for us. It is the authority for us. So do not be man followers. Be Christ followers. And in being Christ followers, be Scripture followers. If everybody's doing that, we'll be just fine. Recognize again that obey and submit are not a claim to an absolute authority. Obey and submit does not mean that the, the elders are authoritative in everything and to everybody. Remember what Scripture tells us on numerous occasions. The elders have authority and can ask for obedience and submission only when they are speaking in a way that lines up with Scripture. So spiritual leaders bear responsibility for speaking the Word of God to the congregation and for leading and guiding within those parameters. And when they are doing that, they are to be followed. So some practical considerations, some just practical words regarding us, elders. So our church, and thus the elders within it, are governed by the Word of God first and foremost. Everything in submission to the Word of God. But we also have a couple of key documents within our church which we submit to as well. We have a church constitution, which isn't all that exciting and isn't all that long. But more importantly, we have a statement of faith as reflective of God's Word. So I'm going to teach you a couple of really cool Latin terms this morning. So the Bible for us is norma normans, which is the unnormed norm or the norm that norms everything else. The documents which we follow are the norma normata, the normed norm. So the Bible is our ultimate authority, which cannot be changed and altered by anybody. Our documents are the normed norm. They are the norm for us as a congregation, but they are... They are made that way because of their, their reflection of Scripture. And I say it that way to recognize that we all recognize that we are all bound by both of these norms. We're bound ultimately by the norm of Scripture, but we are also bound by the norm of our documents. We're bound by the same documents, church membership documents, uh, the 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 church statement of faith, the church's statement on discipline, all of those things we are all equally submissive to. This means that all members are held accountable to it, even each individual elder. And I say that to say this, that Matthew or 1 Timothy chapter 5 talks about what happens if an elder is caught in unrepentant sin. But there are other passages like Matthew 18 which speak of how to deal with fellow believers when caught in sin. And that is the norm for all of us. Right? We are all part of a sanctifying, or all, we are all part of a sanctifying process of Christian growth. And that involves dealing with our sin. And so as elders, as, as individual members of the church, we are all striving by God's grace to overcome sin and to embrace the beauty and purity of the gospel. And so we're all in this together. And, as, and when we are in it together, God calls a few of us out to be the shepherds. But that doesn't mean that we are not all battling the same stuff. We're no better than you in our sanctification 
where hopefully some of us are further along than others, but that's, that sanctifying process is something that's part of our life forever. So what we end up with then is a biblical juggling act. With all the warnings and limitations that are there in Scripture, have we sapped all the meaning from the words obey and submit? Well, the short answer is obviously no. Verse 17 calls for a default attitude of obedience and submission to the elders. It doesn't say obey them if you like them, obey them if they do what you want. It just says obey them and submit to them. That's your attitude. But biblical nuance is necessary. Elders are not perfect. They're sinners just like all of us. And the checks and balances provided by Scripture are to be used. When we appoint an elder, be very, very careful in the laying on of hands, Paul says. In other words, you better be dang sure that you've got an elder when you lay your hands on a man and make him one. And then there's that criteria should not just disappear once he becomes an elder. It should be used to check up on your elders. It should be used to pray for your elders to make sure that they're doing the right work among the flock. And even though elders aren't perfect, the congregation is still called to obey and submit to their leadership, to their shepherding, to their oversight. And if we mess that up, the entire church gets messed up. So why should I submit? That's what the second half of verse 17 deals with. So our author doesn't just say obey and submit. He wants to give us three very, very encouraging reasons why we should submit. The first one, he says, they are keeping watch over your souls. Keep watch is, uh, it's got sort of shepherding, but also military connotations. So shepherding is, is that idea of the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks by night. That idea. That the, shepherd, the sheep are, are sleeping, they're going about their business, but the shepherds know that there are wolves that come out at night, and so they're watching. They're not sleeping. The sheep are, but they're not. They keep vigilant. Uh, there's also military terms, like a soldier guarding their post, or a watchman at the city gates uh, watching for ne'er-do-wells who may desire to enter into the city and cause problems. Now, depending on what translation you have, the ESV translate this passage properly. Uh, they're keeping watch over your souls. If you have, I think, an NIV, it, will, it, will, it, uh, it won't have the word soul in there, which is unfortunate because that is, it's there and it needs to be translated as such. See, the aim of the elder is to watch over your soul. What does that mean? Well, look back at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, just for one example. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere their souls. This is the goal of an elder when he is soul watching over you, that you would persevere in your faith and your souls would be saved. Elders don't merely manage people. We don't just merely come up with church budgets. We don't just look after our building. We are primarily here to save your souls. Now, that means a couple of other things. It doesn't mean that we're here for your physical or emotional or relational well-being. We're not here to pump up your ego or to make you feel good on Sunday mornings. We're not here to satisfy your desires, to make sure you get what you want out of the church experience. We're not here to cater to the whims of anyone or even the entire group. Elders are primarily in the business of saving your soul and of seeking to make sure that you receive what you need spiritually so that you will be able to stand tall and not shrink back. Salvation in the book of Hebrews is not a one-time event, never, never has been. It's, it's not just a one-time decision. It's a lifelong battle against temptation and unbelief. And the primary job of the elder is to help you persevere in your faith and be saved. Keep reading in verse 17. The elder is to keep watch over your souls 
And as he does so, to recognize that he will have to give an account for the way in which he keeps watch. See, I like this. It scares the daylights out of me, but I like it. Let me tell you first why it scares me. Because leaders are more accountable to God for their behavior than any Christian is accountable to God. Christian leaders should be godly and set good examples. So good, in fact, as verse 7 of chapter 13 says, that they're worthy of imitation. We are God's under-shepherds. We represent God to you. We are so supposed to speak God's word to you and lead you and guide you to Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, we are held to a much higher standard than anybody else in the church. And the author is serious. There is a time of accounting that will take place. An accounting that all spiritual leaders in the church will face. When our day is done... We will give an account for the discharge of our responsibilities in the church to the chief shepherd. So we are reminded to live and serve as those who will answer to the Lord for the church that we have been given to our care. There's nothing that strikes fear into my heart more than this phrase. Elders will have to give an account for how they've ministered. And yet on the same time, this is wonderfully freeing because I don't have to do anything that you tell me to do. I'm not accountable to you. That sounds a little cold, doesn't it? See, at the end of the day, when I die and face the great throne of judgment, you're not going to be sitting on the throne. I'm not going to have to make an account to you for how I've shepherded you. So that frees me in this life to kind of say the things that need to be said, to do the things that I need to do, to lead in the way that I need to lead, irregardless of how you might feel about me. Because I will have to give an account to a much, much higher power. And that should encourage you. That, much, that should encourage you to know that Jared is scared out of his freaking mind every day of his life as he interacts with me. Not because he's intimidated by me, but because he's intimidated by what God has called him to do. So there's freedom and there's fear within this phrase. So it's a weird sort of dynamic. As elders watch over your soul, they care more about God's verdict in their life than your verdict over their life. And I think an elder that has that perspective is an elder that's worth obeying and submitting to. Second thing our author says, why should you obey to, and submit to your elders? Well, they keep watch over their, your souls. They have to give an account to God. So recognize that. Second thing, let them do it with joy and not with groaning. Elders fate, face weighty responsibilities in the church and great demands from the chief shepherd of the church. They're to give leadership to the congregation in the ways of God. They're to teach and exhort the congregation in the doctrines of God's word. They're to live exemplary lives, serving as living models of the Christian faith to the congregation. They're to constantly watch over the souls in their care, guarding them from deceit, error, and sin. They're to protect the flock against the poison of false doctrine. They're to protect the church against individual temptations. And in light of all of this, the church is supposed to welcome that work so that they can do it with joy and not with groaning. Joy and groaning are two very different terms. Joy is easy to understand. It's happiness. It's excitement. It's, it's, it's desire to continue. Groaning here describes a, a wide range of negative emotions, frustration and, and longing, lament, shame, uh, oppression, sadness, dying, those kinds of things are all involved in groaning. Robert Machane again writes this, Love your pastor. You little know the anxieties, temptations, pains, and wrestlings that he will be called to bear for you. You see, the pastor is someone who is called to stand between you and the devil. And as a result of that, his job is to be, you are to treat him in such a way that his job is to be done with joy. Third thing, very quickly, his job is to be done 
or you're to obey and submit to the leaders because it's no advantage to you if you do not obey and submit to him. Very, that's very simple to understand. The way God has structured his church is for the benefit of everybody. When you have an elder who is leading with joy, leading with happiness, battling and struggling and, and all of those things, that's part of being an elder. But when, when an elder knows that, that when he is doing the things that he's called to do by God and, and you are accepting those things from him the way you are to accept them, it is to the betterment of everybody. He gets joy and you get joy. You get, you, he gets to do what God is wanting him to do and he knows that he can give an account to God in a positive way and you get the advantage of having your soul saved. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we should want for someone else to keep watch over our souls? See, that's, that's part of our discipleship. That's, that's not just something that only elders are to do with us. That's, that's part of our spiritual relationship. We are to want people to keep watch over our souls because that is an advantage to us. And so when an elder is doing his job, we all benefit from it. Let me just wrap this up with some very practical ways of thinking here. Let me just wrap it up with some things to pray for, actually. As you think about your elders, think about a few of the relationships that your elders have and pray for them. First of all, think about the relationships that the elders have to you as a congregation. It's a very weighty thing that God has called elders to do within the church. Pray for them that in their relationship with the congregation, that they'll be able to fulfill those particular responsibilities. Pray for them in their relationship with God because you recognize that they are accountable to God. Pray for your elders that God would give them the ability, the strength, the courage, the wisdom to do what needs to be done so that when they face their maker, they will be deemed to be good and faithful servants. Uh, pray for your elders in their relationship to, dare I say it, the devil, the world, sin, as we have seen many, many times throughout church history, we don't have to look very far back into church history, maybe a couple of weeks. There's nothing that, that destroys the witness of the gospel, the beauty of Jesus Christ, the glory of God more than when an elder or a pastor falls from his position due to his own sin. There's nothing that destroys the witness of the gospel, the beauty of Jesus Christ, the glory of God more than when a church is at each other because the leaders suck and the congregation sucks. So pray for the elders that they will be protected from the attacks of, of Satan and the devil against the church. Go through the passage in 1 Timothy 3 and pray for your elders that God would develop within them those characteristics. Pray through Hebrews 13, 17 and ask that God give you the willingness, the disposition to submit and to obey to your elders. Go through Hebrews 13, 17 and, and pray that God will give you the proper attitude towards your leaders which will lead to joy in them and to advantage for the entire body. Pray through 1 Peter chapter 5. And ask that God will enable the leaders to be the kinds of shepherds over the church that God will want them to be. That they'd be willing to serve. That they would reject any desire for power or lordship. And that they would truly be men that are worthy of following. And then lastly, pray for the future. Pray that God would raise up men beyond these current group of elders. Men with godly character, men with godly desire to fulfill the role of the elder in years to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we recognize the difficulty of reading words like obedience and submission. We recognize how problematic 
our attitudes can be. We recognize the many hurts that there are within our body because of poor leaders in the past. And Lord, we, we ask within those difficulties for you to sanctify our attitudes, to sanctify the way we think, the way we feel, so that we can truly obey the word of God as it is written. Lord, I pray for each one of these elders that you have raised up over this congregation, that you would give to them the proper character, the proper attitude, the proper recognition of accountability, the proper desire to shepherd. And Lord, that you would continue to sanctify them, protect their marriages, protect their families. And Lord, I pray for each one of us in the congregation that we would have a willingness to follow them as they follow Christ. And that, Lord, as a church body, that we would be a shining light to the beauty of the gospel because we get this thing right. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to fellowship, to participate in some fun in the sun here in a few short minutes. Pray your blessing upon our time together, that you would grow relationships, and that you would grow our church. Amen.